the service Lorlan and Cowan, I sucked Caro Horts do and Kench Shaw Hortsmark Hudge the straight lake day on Cowan. Three years ago, I delivered a talk at Cavan Library entitled Old Scores and Hard Borders, the GA and Cavan and Ulster's Crises, 1918 to 20. And that recounted a successful time on the playing field for Cavan and football, but also quite a, a fractious and even schismatic uh, phase of its history, uh, where the county was at odds with others, uh, and particularly within its own province. And... Um, there was even a motion that Cavan should secede from Ulster and form a separate province of Tara, which didn't transpire in the end up, but was nonetheless a very significant uh, development. Um, today, though, I am talking about the period immediately afterwards. From fields of battle to breath in the opening, partition the War of Independence, Civil War of the Jay in Ulster, 1921 to 23. The difference in this case is that whereas Cavan didn't necessarily enjoy the same amount of success in the playing field. At a time of huge turbulence nationwide and the collapse of Gaelic Games and many other places, the GA and Cavan actually came together and achieved great things infrastructurally and in terms of even relationships within the county at a difficult time that set it in great stead for the years and decades to come. Um, so I'll start off with this newspaper advertisement uh, from August 1920 of a Cavan versus Monaghan match at a Bell Turbot. There will be no peace in Ulster until after Sunday, August 22nd, said this advertisement with the name of Owen O'Duffy at the bottom, a secretary of Ulster. The match of the century, it's also billed. And this is playing on words that obviously the sectarian and political problems in Ulster at the time were pretty uh, strong at the time of the shipyards, um, uh, riots and so on in 1920. But also it reflects Cavan and Monaghan's very close, indeed intense, if not bitter rivalry at times over the previous decade. Ono Duffy was very uh, strong propagandist, if, if nothing else. Um, so Cavan at this point had won three in a row in Ulster uh, football and were, had achieved a new level of supremacy. Um, but through 1920, the War of Independence gradually spread to Ulster. Um, one of the key figures in that was Owen Duffy himself, as, main, as the uh, through his role in Fifth Northern Division IRA, it was the rapid rise he had had through the Irish Volunteers in IRA since 1917, and was one of the main men in Ulster by early 1920, and the main man um, by um, 1921. And um, the, this period saw, particularly as a result of O'Duffy's machinations, a very close interweaving of Ulster GA and IRA activity. And on this occasion shown here from the Ulster Council Minutes of April 1920 at a meeting in Armagh, I quote, at this stage, armed aliens surrounded the place of meeting and invaded the room. The secretary had been taken away by the military oppressors. The council deliberations were only suspended while members wished their secretary Godspeed and good wishes for a safe return. For some time, the meeting was carried on under the eyes of the oppressor as an armed guard was placed in the room. And then they returned to talking about expenses. But this um, arrest led to O'Duffy uh, being detained in Crumlin Road Jail, Belfast. And it was not unique. Uh, Seamus Dobbin, who was the Ulster president from Antrim at this time and also a leading member of the IRB, also spent some time uh, in, in jail being arrested in the following month. And as a result of these and the other activities that they, that, that particular Duffy got up to when not in prison, essentially his military organising, um, amongst other things, uh, as well as the state of the country, was responsible for the Ulster Council itself collapsing for a period of 15 months from July 1920 until October 1921. No competitions at Ulster level or anything like that were organised. Um, and, of course, the War of Independence intensified through late 1920 and into early 1921. Bloody Sunday at Croke Park, 21st of November 1920, is one of the most infamous episodes within that whole conflict. Several cabinet members of the GA were present, 
Uh, one of them gives an account here. MJ Lynch, County Councillor of Bailiborough, a prominent member of the County Committee, GA, occupied one of the sidelines, Station Croke Park, so one of the closest to the action, and talks about how he saw uh, young Hogan falling dead. Um, and this is significant because as the War of Independence continued into 1921, um, the uh, and and there were occasional incidents of uh, where an IRA activity or operation sparked retaliation from the Crown forces. There was a very strong feeling among members of the GA players and officials that they could, in their own way, suffer a similar fate, um, if they got the wrong side of black and tans, or auxiliaries. So there was, that fear was always there uh, after Bloody Sunday. Uh, so here's an example of one such event. Uh, at Drumkelly in May 1921, where Black and Tans uh, interrupted a match after 10 minutes between Bally McHugh and Drumkelly in the Junior League. Uh, come on the grounds and commandeered some men to fill road trenches. Uh, nobody got hurt in this case. Uh, the match was abandoned. It was more of an isolated incident than a regular one. Um, there were similar episodes in County Louth in 1921 as well. 1920 and 21. Um, so there weren't, was, this wasn't entirely isolated. But um, it's probably fair to say that relative to many other counties, um, Cavan for one, uh, escaped the brunt of a lot of the worst of the War of Independence uh, events uh, in, in this time in terms of um, fields being occupied or taken over, uh, players being attacked uh, and so on. Um, but I'm going to talk, focus on what's going on in Ulster more generally uh, at this time. And one of the points I would make is that uh, for most of 1921 and 22 and indeed 1923, some of the Ulster counties had collapsed entirely. Uh, Trone and Fermanagh county boards had collapsed for 21, 22 and 23 into it. Uh, Armagh missed at least uh, a year, uh, about 1922, um, 21, 22, and Down was out for a period as well. The only places which um, seemed to keep strong outside of Cavan, uh, were uh, Derry City counterintuitively having been very up and down for many years but after the municipal cooperation went over to the national side in 1920 there was a bit of a resurgence of Gaelic games and there was an amnesty of former soccer players and the Brandywell became available for Gaelic games um, uh, the, the, the council owned grounds which is now used by Derry City FC and Belfast through the strength of Nationalist West Belfast, West Belfast managed to keep going largely throughout but I suppose what I want to say is it didn't mean that there were no Gaelic games, but it was much more sporadic. It was fitful. Uh, it wasn't necessarily organised on a county basis. If there was a league, it might be on a district basis. And sometimes, again, they defied uh, the events of the time because, for example, we see an East, East Donegal North Throne League arising immediately after partition or either in 1921-22. Um, sports days, like such as the one featured in this very rare early programme of a sports day, at, a GA sports day at Derry McCash in North Armagh, um, you know, these things did continue, um, but county championships as well as Ulster Championship were very much in abeyance and uh, people were fearful for their safety. Some men were on the run. It was logistically difficult, restrictions on travel. Um, everything was a bit chaotic, but Cavan was one of those counties that managed to keep going. Um, so here's just an example of North Derry, a place which had never really been strong for Gaelic games. Um, but here's the O'Connor's team that had won a league of several teams uh, and on the right uh, is a, 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 an advertisement for uh, a GA sports day uh, at the Brandywell uh, in September 1921 um, most notable for the address by Dr Owen McNeil, Speaker of Dáil Aaron, which again shows the strength of the link between um, the GA and Republicanism with this sort of high time in the national events. Um, this was also very notable in a couple of clubs, uh, in particular O'Donovan Rosses of Belfast, who formed in 1917, uh, and who consisted at this time essentially of the officers uh, of the IRA in Belfast, some of whom came from other provinces. You can see this photograph from around the turn of the 20s, so you can see the tricolours and the jerseys. This club uh, became a prominent several respects, very strong in hurling and Gaelic football. Um, few clubs would have been as closely tied to IRA, even in the cities, um, but um, nonetheless a significant club that uh, reached uh, great strength this time. Now, as 
1921 war on, um, O'Duffy becomes more and more significant. Uh, here he is on the left addressing a large crowd at Armagh. It's actually, it looks like he's at Gaelic goalposts. I'm reliably informed those are not Gaelic goalposts despite appearances, but it is on a Gaelic pitch. It was the college grounds of St. Patrick's College Armagh. And this was on the occasion of the visit of Michael Collins to Armagh in that month of September. And on this occasion, he, he made a speech that became quite notorious. He talked, he was asked about loyalists and he said they could give them the lead. And this sort of resounded and um, gave O'Duffy a very bad reputation among Ulster Unionists and loyalists for some years afterwards. And to extrapolate from that, you can imagine how the, having O'Duffy as a figurehead in the GA and having become some, some sort of a uh, an amical figure that uh, you know statements such as that wouldn't have necessarily reflected very well in the GA either for that matter but in any case O'Duffy was involved in so many things at this time that when he began to move towards reviving the Ulster Council again in, in, in autumn 1921 the man on the right Dan Hogan his prodigy in many respects was key to those plans Hogan had come from Tipperary worked in the GNR Great Northern Railway at Clonus he was a brother of Michael Hogan, shot dead on, on Bloody Sunday in 1920. Um, had actually become by this stage the captain of the Monaghan football team. And the photograph very much reflects a man, you could say, looks very confident in his ability uh, and in his newfound status. There he is wearing his new uniform uh, with his impressive uh, gun. Uh, 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 presumably a car that he has at his uh, disposal behind him and this is in front of Lo the big house that Loch Bawn House uh, County Monaghan and um, his very countenance and physical appearance uh, is such of a man who is um, looks like he commands authority and is confident in it and it seems indeed that he was that his name crops up quite a bit actually in the early 20s in, in all aspects of Ulster GA affairs, but in Cavan as well, uh, as a, often as a referee. Uh, but uh, when the Ulster Council resumes activity of 15 month hiatus in October 1920, Hogan is appointed by, with O'Duffy being so busy with many other things, doesn't attend all the meetings, Hogan gets appointed as the Ulster Secretary or as Assistant Secretary, which is significant because he was also in the IRA. So it, it, it does seem a further development of O'Duffy's policy of blurring the lines between the area and the Ulster Council G at that time. Now, well, there is the meeting of, of October 1921 where they reconvened and you'd see there the Monaghan delegates, Dan D. Hogan is in beside Owen Conlon. Uh, O'Duffy's missing on this occasion. It's quite notable that whenever the Ulster Council did resume, after so much had happened in the intervening period, the Government of Ireland Act in 1920, December, had uh, essentially been the first stage of the partition, and that was then reinforced by the establishment of the Northern Ireland State and the opening of the Parliament in May, June of that year. And strangely, the Ulster Council Minutes don't actually make a direct reference to this at any stage at that point. You'd have to actually speed on uh, months, maybe even years, to find references to um, the six counties or the, the northeastern uh, regime or something like that. No no direct references to partition. It, it was the, the attitude seemed to be, well, the GA doesn't recognise any border, doesn't recognise partition. We're not going to acknowledge that this new state has even come into being. Uh, but it, do, it did strangely um, make a, such a, um, a statement with regard to the Football Association of Ireland, which was newly formed. It was where the Leinster branch of the IFA had seceded due to the satisfaction over fixer venues and so on, selections. And um, the Ulster Council thought it necessary in that autumn 1920 period, two or 21 period, to make a re pass a resolution uh, about the activity of the FAA and warning counties against it, uh, that it was this body was as antagonistic to the GF, not more so than the Irish Football Association itself. Um, so unusual, maybe you might think that that um, that this should be the the, the thing that the um, the Ulster Council um, hones in on as being um, a threat, but I suppose it's the the old age old rivalry of sports. Uh, in, in between uh, Gaelic games and soccer in particular. Now, the Ulster Council, I'm, I'm dealing with Ulster matters first and I'll focus more on Cavan as we go along, but the Ulster Council uh, set about organising a, a, a belated 1921 championship. Um, Cavan uh, 
drew with Monaghan in the Ulster semi final at uh, in in December nineteen twenty one and uh, lost the replay. Um, but more on that and on, Derry beat Antrim, somewhat surprisingly. And so the final was fixed surprise, it was unusually for the Brandywell Derry. Now, this is the first and only fixture ever, Ulster final ever fixed for Derry City. Um, and it was unusual in itself. January the 15th is also an unusual date for an Ulster final. Owen Duffy TD was to throw in the ball, having been... Um, elected as such in September past. Um, but Nima Hilter a beater. This final never took place, or at least not on that date. Because on their way to the match in their motor cars on the Saturday before the, the fixture, uh, Monon players were stopped at Dromore County Tyrone by special constabulary members and they were arrested. They were found to be in possession of a number of rifles. And they were kept, they were detained. Uh, this caused uh, uproar with um, um, Owen O'Duffy pressing the Dublin government. Michael Collins made representations to James Craig in the new Northern part, a new Northern government. And indeed, at different stages, the Westminster government was brought into this. There was a bit of a three-way impasse. Um, the security forces and the Northern authorities uh, were convinced that the Monaghan footballers uh, were not primarily going to Derry for a football match, that they were indeed going to uh, either rescue or perform reconnaissance ahead of a rescue of three prisoners who were uh, now under death sentence, having in a previous escape uh, used chloroform that inadvertently killed a prison guard. And... Um, so this was what the, the securities, the, 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 the authorities, the Northern authorities believed. Now, Dublin and O'Duffy didn't accept that. However, there are a number of points which suggest mm, that may not be the full story. I go back to the point, no Ulster final has ever been pointed to Derry City uh, before, albeit it was going through a bit of quite a, a boom at that time. But it was most unlike Monaghan to travel the way there. The, no neutral venue was chosen. Um, I suppose... It may have been difficult to find one north of the border, you could argue, but the nature of the, tra the, the, the travel of the players to, you know, they, they didn't get a train. Um, they maintained that they were carrying the guns by way of self-defence through hostile territory and that they were not, that they were now members of the National Army, such as it was in this um, sort of intervening period after the treaty. So the National Army was beginning to take shape. New form of Ugly Nahran. But the, the players in question maintained that it just was that they need these guns for self-protection as they went into, as they might pass through loyalist um, areas on the way to Derry. Um, given the way that O'Duffy very deliberately overlapped activity between the GA and the IRA, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that they weren't up to something while they were up there, although there was a match planned, that there was an attempt to utilize the opportunity to some uh, end for the for the for the sake of those prisoners. Um, but the event in itself took on wider significance because of what it's what spiraled from it, because while the players were being detained, um, O'Duffy organized the kidnap of dozens of border loyalists and prominent unionist citizens which caused a lot of, quite a controversy in itself. That sparked uh, Reading in Belfast and led to several deaths and, and violence in general increased. Among the GA members uh, who died, I, I, I compiled a list of GA members who died during the War of Independence that appeared in the GA website back in, in the early months of the year. And of the 80 odd members of the GA who died uh, during the conflict that could be identified as such, this is one of them, Frank McCoy, who was originally from Mullabon, County Armagh, but played for the Antrim football team. Uh, and he was in the area and was shadowing a policeman when he was shot dead. Uh, and the letter that I've shown here is interesting because it's from the O'Rahilly Club, but it talks about how they've expressed their sympathy and that they belong to this, that they belong to the same company IRA. So a bit like O'Donnell Ross of this club at least purports to be to be a GA and IRA club. That was very much. Um, a minority 
um, case. But nonetheless, um, it was a period of a very tumultuous period, and the Monaghan footballers period had just a whole spin off of events from that, made things more fractious again. And um, of course, this happened at a time whenever Col- Michael Collins had with O'Duffy uh, been planning a Northern Offensive. And ahead of that happening, the um, Storm, the Belfast government uh, did a mass wave of internment in May 1922 and putting people in the prison ship Argenta and the Lauren internment camp. And this is an interesting information sheet from an internment case of Dan, you know, Daniel Dempsey, who was, had pre- previously for six years been the county chairman for Antrim County Board. And the information sheet says that he had always kept in company of prominent Sinn Feiners, prominent member of the Gaelic League and great enthusiast of Gaelic Games, frequent express Sinn Féin party views, uh, and is most likely a member of the area, but does not openly drill with them or march with them, recommended for internment. So in other words, they didn't really have anything concrete on him. Uh, but because he was an influential figure and kept in the, maybe in a certain social circle, that was enough. And that's significant because when people like that were removed, and quite a few of them, quite a few people like this were removed from communities and counties, it meant that they either collapsed, the, 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 the sporting and other social structures collapsed, or they were, they were already collapsed and this prevented them from getting up and running again. Um, so, and it's worth saying a few words about the new Northern government and their attitude to sport. They were drawn from the upper reaches of society and didn't necessarily have a, had a very different view of sport. Um, uh, even, um, you know, they didn't, people might presume that the new government might have promoted association football and rugby, which are perhaps the two codes that are most closely associated with the Northern Ireland brand today. Well, sorry, soccer is an Ulster in rugby. Um, but no, whenever insofar as this government um, identified itself with sports, uh, some of the some of them, James Craig and Dawson Bates, were patrons of Glenavon FC in Belfast. But insofar as the government made any attempt to really in, endorse sport, and that it wasn't actually field games; it was actually motorsports. And the Motorcycles Races Act of nineteen twenty one, uh, nineteen twenty two, sorry, was enabled enabled local councils to close roads for the hosting of rallies and races. And this gave rise to the first Ulster Grand Prix in 1922, among many other races, which have stood the, which stood the test of time through the decades and became very closely associated with the province. But the reason for doing this was, first of all, to promote NA as a tourist venue for people coming from Great Britain, and second, to try and lure in motor manufacturers to set up business here. That didn't really work out, but... Um, the, the, these events, this race, the Ulster TT, uh, Northwest 200, they all established their own profile and heritage. Another perspective that they had on uh, sport and recreation, uh, which is very different maybe from that prevailing in GA and circles and um, maybe that of the southern state, was um, the, the tourism. You see this poster, a very um, interesting poster. So it promotes fishing, golfing, boating, Bathing, yachting, and tennis in Ulster. Mark you, Ulster, not Northern Ireland. And the map I find fascinating because here's a lady golfer, which is very much ref- uh, uh, a, a novel of the time, I suppose. Um, the, the flapper age and um, uh, like a character, Jordan from Great Gatsby. But uh, her, her lovely curved shoulder just happens to eclipse those troublesome counties of Cavan and just doesn't fit Monaghan to see that they're so... Uh, the promotion of, of this new Northern Irish entity uh, as a golf location um, just uh, it just so happens that she hap- she her shoulders uh, happily uh, cover around that uh, but it's it's very interesting the marketing um, but there's no mention of any team sports or anything out there that's not the perspective on sport um, it was still very much I think of the private sphere. But there were in quite a number of ways that the new Northern regime was not favourable to Gaelic Games and such activities um, due to an exemption clause from the 1916 Entertainment Act. Uh, entertainment tax, sorry. Uh, Gaelic Games as national pastimes, they were exempt. Um, but the Ministry of Finance very covertly removed this uh, in 1923 um, in Belfast after some protests from uh, association football clubs. Um, 
So some GA clubs then began to find themselves subject to prosecutions as a result of get, taking get money at games. Um, then one of the things that backbenchers, unionist backbenchers, strongly believed was that now that their own parliament, they could finally see the 1685 Lords of the Observance Act imposed as it had been in the 19th century to prevent outdoor games on Sundays because the police guidelines had advised against things that give rise to disorder. And Gaelic football and hurling could be deemed within that. Um, but the man pictured here, Charles Wickham, the Chief Inspector of the uh, Royal Ulster Constabulary, uh, well, he may have been expected by a lot of unionist figures to, to clamp down on these and maybe that the environment may have been more favourable to clamp down on such troublesome uh, sports and Sundays disturbing the, the the Sabbath that he really he determined against that that um, that, it, that that it wasn't a wise thing to do and one one cannot help but feel that he may have had in mind the events of Gaelic Sunday nineteen eighteen when so many clubs simultaneously nationwide had staged uh, games in defence of the requirement to have police permits and the realization also that in order to stop all these games taking place. They would have recruited many more police, uh, employed many more police officers on Sundays, which would have, to an extent, defeated the purpose of keeping a quiet Sunday. So um, this did not transpire, but pressure remained for this for some years, but didn't actually take place in outdoor ban and outdoor games. But it was a, a, there was an awful lot. Of, so there was a great degree of uh, disapproval of it, and it was hard to get grounds because of it. Uh, a lot of uh, land. Uh, was not allowed to get at games, whether privately owned or, or publicly owned, because the games took place on Sundays for the most part. Um, there were also some uh, obstacles that weren't all called, caused by the North. Uh, the Free State Government's um, customs regulations were very obstructive, uh, it was said and complained about by Ulster GA members. Um, and also uh, the the climate north of the, the border for even hosting matches on a Sunday, even in the town that might have been favourable for them, uh, due to legislation removing bona fide travellers clauses, you know, it was not possible for pubs to open on the day um, north of the border as they had previously. Um, and it was, it was very hard to get anything to eat out uh, on a Sunday. So these certain things all militated against the hosting of major games north of the border in the years immediately after partition. Um, so this is uh, eventually from 1923 there begins to be a revival in certain counties although it took till 1924 in Fermanagh and some other, uh, Derry itself was very fitful, uh, this is from the Trone County Board, a very modest record in the meeting uh, of the clubs again in May 1923 and the representatives of each club um, so, but it was a very significant thing for G for um, the counties north of the border, the nationals community to get revived again because um, so much had happened. They found themselves cut adrift. So many had been, it was a very dispiriting time for them. They found themselves cut off from the south. And the GA represented a chance to keep in step with that, to feel that they were still part of an all-Ireland all Irish body uh, and something to raise their spirits again at local level, community level uh, and beyond. Um, uh, and you find that the revival is also led by schools and priests, uh, where schools were, which mightn't have adopted them, the games to the extent that before. So here, for example, is from a fine album from St. Patrick's College Armagh and Father Rafferty there, uh, refereeing and coaching Gaelic football and also handball. And um, this uh, was replicated in other northern seminaries. Very notable that St. Malachy's College Belfast takes to Gaelic uh, after many years of soccer at this time. And indeed, this photograph is the very first one in which an, uh, any bishop, I think, is um, pictured with uh, in a Gaelic Games context. Obviously, Archbishop Croke had given his endorsement to the GA at the outset, but until Bishop McCrory made a, delivered a stirring speech in favour of Gaelic Games at St Mary's Hall, Belfast, 1916, and that speech then was inserted in the Gaelic GA official guide for many years afterwards. Um, but um, there was no other bishop that I know of that had endorsed it in such a significant way and here to be pictured and indeed McCrory then uh, presented the cup that became known as the McCrory Cup in 1923 and that became a huge, not only a prize, but um, it had developed its own culture uh, and, and helped to 
ensure that Gaelic games retain, remain, retain the primary interest of schoolboys, Catholic schoolboys in Ulster. Uh, there's the regulations from the first competition as such in 1923-24. One of the rules, no smoking to be allowed in the premises of the college visited. Um, only three teams taking part. St. Patrick's Cabin, among others, would join later. But it's significant that Gaelic Games is forming, even though it was very much knocked down in many respects. Um, it's it's in the it, you know there's a big the early rallying um rev of revival in different respects and that would have long term significance. One of the effects of partition as well on the GN Ulster was that um there was a strength a, a, a feeling of defence and this led to maybe a stronger attachment to the retention of the ban on against soccer, rugby, cricket and hockey or foreign games as they came known and um, this is the closest that there was to a debate to rescind them uh, in 1924 at Ulster level. Uh, there was a very interesting debate, but uh, there was no serious prospect of that, of, a, of Ulster. In there were some counties that voted differently, but in general, Ulster tended to be, form a block against um, these rules and indeed put forward a number of other rules in later years, which strengthened the cultural defence um, in terms of dancing and other things. Um, but if we move to Cavan, 1921, uh, Cavan didn't suffer as badly as other counties, but it did endure quite a lot, nonetheless. It's interesting, in his secretary's report for the year 1921, uh, Patrick Leonard, the sec acting secretary, uh, he, he described the year as, particularly the early part, as covered by the reign of terror. And yet this report is one of progress and success. At the time of the last convention, many oppressive acts had been carried out by the British forces. The cannons of some of our hurling clubs had been seized and broken. GA books and documents had been confiscated and many of our best and most enthusiastic gales were in prison or on the run. And yet they had surmounted these problems. And among other things, uh, it's notable that during 1921, particularly after the truce, that members of the IRA uh, come more to the fore as referees as, and also um, doing duty, and they were praised for, for their work during 1920 for the great aid in keeping order at matches. Uh, so they were helping to impose discipline on and off the field of play. The man pictured here, Paul McShane, was something of a, a Sinn Féin idealist from uh, Corn of Fame, and he was one of a number of members of uh, the GAA in the county, as in other counties, who were interned during this time. Uh, and he um, was eventually released after as a, uh, the, the, the treaty and the return of the, intern of the internees to Cavan in December 1921 uh, was an occasion of uh, significant celebration uh, and among that party released were uh, McShane, I should say, was in Ballykinler and Ka Terminal Camp and organised Gaelic, it was one of the main people who organised Gaelic League or Gaelic Games Leagues there Um. um and uh, we, we got support from the county board for them. Um, but McShane came, McShane came back, Eugene Smith of Cavan Town, P.F. Baxter Bonboy, John J. J. Coyle, uh, Paddy Carlin of Virginia, the captain of the county football team, also was inside and released in December 1921. And uh, significantly, they came together uh, just in time for um, the Ulster semi final of 1921, which was played in December against Monaghan and ended up in a draw. Uh, the replay was played at Clonus at the very first few days of, of 1922 uh, and Monaghan um, won the game, but perhaps most significantly, uh, some of the players in both teams, as I said, who had been in different camps for a considerable time past, had a warm handshake from each other and were all warmly received by Owen O'Duffy TD, who was an interested spectator. So the Gaelic, <clears throat> you see how Gaelic games matches and um, pitches are scenes or for bringing people back together and bringing them back among the community. Um, now, it should be pointed out that Gaelic games were not, you know, you had people like Dan Hogan in charge, of, like Dan Hogan refereeing the, the, the Cavan County final of 19, September 1921 between Kingscourt and, uh, well, Kingscourt won using their combination play against the Brusky team who were more prone to catching and lengthy drives 
And so Dan Hogan, common and Dan Hogan is coming from on and comes in and referees that match and asserts his authority. But um, but it's important to note that not everybody was, you know, avidly Republican during this time. There were others who took a different view. It's, it's, it's still in 1921, there are clubs in East Cavan that seem to sing from a different hymn sheet. So you have the likes of Bailey Bear Redmonds and Killan Joe Devlin's very much reflecting the Irish Parliamentary Party home rule tradition. And indeed, the, the Redmond Club is using the an AOH branch and in, Inter of Burnians Hall for, uh, or for their um, functions. And, and this is reflective of a of something of a, um, a split. There was actually a separate league in East Cavan for a, a brief period around the, the turn of that decade, and still this is being played out. Uh, this tension between East Cavan and West Cavan in, t- in terms of their attitude to sort of. Some of the politicised rules and policies of the GA, not least the ban's oath taking civil servants, it was imposed in 1819. A diff- several clubs and personalities in East Cavan took a different view on that and sort of went their own way for a period. And it was, it was quite a bit of tension, but it's important to note it that uh, you know, there were different views at this time. The county uh, board, again, was very had much more stability than others. And there wasn't a time, unlike some of the other counties I mentioned, there wasn't a time um, when it, it fell out despite the different problems. And um, the, one, the, the man who was the chairman uh, through this time was Benny Fay of Belterbert, a man who wore different hats, was prominent with the Ulster Council as well as his own club. Um, and um, it, it won, but one of the things that's most remarkable that I have discovered is the extent of female involvement in the county board. Now, in 1920, uh, Miss Mary Brady was elected to Cavan as sort of an early form of suff- uh, expression of suffrage, was elected to Cavan Urban Council. And as a result of that, she ended up becoming elected to the Cavan County Board GA as a vice president for several years in the early 20s. But not only that, if you look through this list of, from the meeting here, um, there are at least five other uh, uh, ladies present representing Camogie clubs um, at this time. I'm not aware of any other manifestation to this extent of female participation at officialdom uh, for, me- for quite a few decades after that. Um, it's indeed some cases still mightn't be that much. Now, it's slightly confusing in this one because four of the ladies involved are called Brady. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it is a very uh, unique development to, to identify, albeit quite short. And uh, it also, at a time when integration is very much mooted, uh, however practical or not it may be, it's very much mooted as a, 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 a mode of um, bringing together the different Gaelic sports bodies as one. Uh, but here Cavan was doing it seamlessly and uh, without breaking a, 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 a without a, a moment's thought. They were doing it automatically. Um, but um, the rule of uh, the, the Cavan County Board uh, was... Um, you know, in 1921, they made the decision to award a salary for the first time, or maybe not the first time, but they to make a salary of £30 for the role. And JJ Clark was appointed to it. Uh, the um, Just a little bit more on the ladies. 1921 was the first Camogie Championship organised by Cavan, as it was, uh, or as it happened to be, or Lady Hurlers, they were often described. So here's two of the teams, Drumbo and Bell Turbot. Uh, Lavi actually became beat Bill Turbot to become the first county champions, um, having not seen the game before that year and uh, being played in their area. And they didn't receive medals for that, but they received brooches, which was a, a nod to um to to the tra- to tradition uh, uh, as well. Um and in that respect, it's also important to note that um and for particularly the 1922 county convention, there was a bit, good pitch made for the promotion of Gaelic games on the playing field. Uh, the Sean McGahan O'Connor and the Gaelic at Kench, less than Tuscary for use as in the Gaelic or in a park in Amherst. Um, but some of the officials said that they had never heard a player use a word of Irish in the field, although some would be sometimes would be heard often among the, the, the spectators. Um, it's also a reflection of the uh, what I said about the IRA's sort of esteem that a motion was passed. Uh, at that 1922 convention that members of the area on duty from home be eligible to play with their home team if they so desire regardless of a normal one month residential qualification um, but um, 
There's also their uh, pathy image of training for the Talton Games. Camogie, the Irish ladies' national game, is now in full swing. There was very, this is for wider audiences, but there was, just as there had been with Gaelic games for men, there was a belief that was promoted very much from this time onwards that Irish ladies, Irish girls, Irish women should play Irish sports. There was a stronger push for that, uh, particularly in Ulster, um, as would become evident in years to come. There is the Talton Games for... Uh, which was had been mooted. Uh, the revival of the ancient Tantal Games had been mooted far back to the 1880s, but it became very much a free state independence project to project the racial vigour of independent Ireland, such as it was on the international stage, to create a sort of a pan Celtic Olympiad. Now, the ad on the left, you notice the Talton Trials National Athletic and Cyclic Association. This is a new uh, organisation that was formed as a merger with the between the GA Sporting, uh, the GA's little track and field wing and the Irish Amateur Athletic Association. And it, ironically, soon after partition, in 1922, these two bodies, which have been loggerheads for nearly 40 years, came together and formed a unified body, but it didn't last. It only lasted a handful of years. It started to break up in 1925. But nonetheless, here it is in existence. For There's one of the first things in 1922. But the Talton Games were going to be a celebration of, in a way, they weren't putting it they got, but it was in a sense meant to be um, a celebration of independence for 26 counties didn't actually take place in 1922 because of the civil war uh didn't actually take place until 1924 but north of the border uh talton games wouldn't have meant very much um but uh, to go back to the the position of of the overlap between the area and, and the ga at this time uh, it would keep it keeps going back to the man hogan and here he is commandant general hogan uh being advertised to throw in the ball uh, for a, gra a great football challenge match uh, for a Thompson machine gun at Bally James Duff on the 14th of May 1922 between C and D battalions. I'm not sure if of the reports who won that. Apparently there was a small crowd. Um, it would have been difficult to, to determine what to do with it, who, who should get the gun, I presume. But uh, I'm not aware of any equivalent prize ever being awarded for Gaelic games. This has become quite infamous. Um, but it is much, very much reflective of the time uh, and indeed the IRA would have uh, you know you've would have had that was holding reviews at Cavan showgrounds uh, before a hurling match uh, and you've you know they're, they're playing the battalions are playing each other they're playing clubs you know you have an unusual score like Belt Herbert Rory's one goal one point IRA nil reported in the paper it doesn't it seems a bit odd um, but you know while, while all this is going on the county board is, um, you know, is, 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 is the county board's doing quite well as, uh, you know, to hold together as the count, as, as the country begins to work towards civil war. Now, the most, in, the most famous case of a, of a county managing to deal with, to sort of come together despite the civil war is Kerry, um, where for many years you had well known figures from both sides of the divide right, right through the 1920s playing together successfully in the same team. But I would argue that here's actually at local level where things can be more intense. Intense, uh, A remarkable thing of the Mullen Harps team that won the 1922 and 23 Mullen County Championships. And on that team, you've got two medical doctors, Dr. Pat McCarville and Dr. Con Ward, who were anti-treaty um, and later became TDs for Fianna Fáil. And on the same team, you have, amongst others, Captain James Brannigan and Lieutenant Frank Common uh, from the Free State Army. And to some extent, they, these, these four and others possibly there too were divided very deeply in terms of political opinion, but they came together and won locally and um, you know, played together in the same team. No, no small feat, which I'm not aware of many examples like that. The only place where counties actually, a county formed separate or different separate forms formed in opposition on treaty lines was in Clare. Uh, but there were there were little bits of the, the signs of the of the civil war in the G A and Cavan. Uh, for example, in July nineteen twenty two, the report on the left, a match between Bailibra and Cross Keys, McSweeney's, at, at Virginia. And when the lorry conveying the Cross Keys team arrived, it was surrounded by national troops. who took one of the players, John J. Coyle, into custody and conveyed him to the local barracks. And as a result of this, Cross Keys refused to play. I think that's the same John J. Coyley was in the party of released internees just um, seven months earlier in December 1921. So how quickly things had changed for him as indeed the country. And another very interesting vignette here is on the right of the motions of sympathy were passed at the same meeting 
of the Calvin County Board in, in August 1922, and you see the resolution motion, a resolution of regret on the death of the late, late President Griffith, and also a motion passed late Harry Boland TD. So Griffith being obviously um, a figurehead for pro-treaty side, and Boland being a very leading, um, very much a leading anti-treaty TD. And the county board was able to do this complaint, and, and there's there was they, they did express at different times great pride in the fact that they had, you know, kept it clear of politics. They hadn't, you know, that each man was entitled to his opinion, but they didn't get into political division. They tried their best to stay clear of it, and they bore the fruit of that. But there were other problems that had to be dealt with and had to be confronted always, and uh, not least that perennial problem of violence. This is a report from the Meath Chronicle, and they seem to be driving the boot in, uh, if pardon the pun. In this case, they said that. Brusky against uh, Brusky McDermott against Virginia Blues. That set that the referee, Father Maguire, curate, was obliged to send seven of the Brusky team to the sideline. Um, and but for the intervention of a number of Irish American priests, matters would have taken a, a more serious aspect. Um, well, I don't know, I can't vouch for what they did, but uh, the report is slightly exaggerated. There were actually three players from Brusky who were sidelined for their actions, two for kicking stom in the stomach and in the abdomen. But this became this was reported nationwide, and the, but this this episode and uh, became a matter of some embarrassment to Calvin officials. Um, and another aspect of discipline that uh, is quite funny is this uh, from this time is about timekeeping in Coot Hill, and in essence, the match was due to start at three o'clock. Coot Hill took the field at three forty-three, and the game started two minutes later. The county board chairman explained that all matches were fixed for three old time, which meant four new time. And any team taking the field 15 minutes late would forfeit the points. However, Cross um, Coot Hill were not prepared to accept that. And Paul Smith of that club stated his team took the field at 4.28 new time, but they recognised no change in the time in Coot Hill. And so there was a difference of one hour and 25 minutes. Um, he produced uh, a postcard from um, the, the county secretary uh, showing that the match was fixed for three. The secretary said, I am not an encyclopedia and don't know what time they recognise in Coot Hill. Smith replied, there's an old new and middle time and we should have got proper instructions. It's a long journey to cross. We were sent to a wilderness and didn't know the road and were delayed getting over broken bridges, which may have been a result of the, the civil war. The bylaws state that whenever possible, teams take the field punctually, but we found it impossible. Um, and then Mr. Carlin wrote, said, when we found Coot Hill was late, we claimed the match from the referee. With the exception of Coot Hill, all Ireland recognises the change in time. But Smith retorted, we thought that a purely Irish organisation should recognise nothing but the real old Irish time. Here, here, it said. Uh, and then a Mr. McCoy chips in to say, if the team started earlier, some of the players would miss mass at 25 minutes past 12, according to their time. And then Mr. Baxter came in to say, is there no early mass? And then McCoy replies, yes. But it wouldn't suit players who reside in the country districts. And then Mr. Smith came in from Coot Hill and said, and another thing, the grounds were only 117 yards by 67, and so on and so on. So every objection is being made, and the county board has to wrestle with all these sort of petty, some of them were significant, uh, some of them were important to tackle by way of uh, improving discipline all around and the attractiveness of the games. But you can see how often the county board got bogged down with smaller issues or things that were outside of their control um, or, or that you know clubs should have, maybe should just have taken a slightly different attitude towards um, and indeed in April 1923 the referees in Cavan are meeting and they decided they've got to have strictly enforced punctuality and flick maximum penalty for rough play or abusive language the conduct of spectators will be carefully watched and all grounds will be marked as directly by the official guide and mark this below this that the following new rule will be enforced when a defending back commits a foul in the parallelogram, the free will be taken from the 14 yards mark. None of the opposing players, other than the goalkeeper, to take up opposition in the scoring space. Scoring space. I put it to you now that that is the penalty kick introduced to Gaelic football at Congress April 1923 and not called anything of the sort. In fact, Gaelic, the word penalty was being used to describe free kicks, and this rule slipped in uh, almost unnoticed. In 1923, only difference from today's penalty is that the, the defending players they didn't actually stand behind the kicker; they stayed, they stood um, between the end line and the line of the 14 line of the kicker, but just not between the goalposts. And um, that's how this rule that a, thought, a century later has caused so much pain, particularly in recent years, to so many players uh, and tight matches that went to the end. So that's how it came in uh, in this year of many developments. 
Another thing that's uh, that may have talked about the role of the IRA and, and refereeing and so on and security. And, but another significant thing is that they bolstered the counties, the, the border counties, Garda, uh, Garda, army um, members and customs officials and so on, civil servants who were coming from other provinces, strong playing traditions and coming and bolstering the, the county combo. And this was particularly the case in Hurling, as you see here, between Monaghan and Cavan. The teams were largely drawn from the civic guards of both counties with a sprinkling of military officers and, of course, civilians. Um, so this was very much the benefit of Cavan. It enabled Cavan and, and Monaghan to pull away. They'd already got a head start on, but they could pull away from the, well, the northern six counties north of the border were falling behind and lagged they were pulling away and the, the chasm was bigger than before it's a remarkable thing that uh, between 1914 and 45 inclusive Cavan and Monaghan had a complete duopoly in the Ulster title and Cavan were, were the, the dominant of them um, so and here, here they are playing in the 1922 um, Ulster sorry the 1922 Ulster final uh, there were actually four as played in May 1923 there were four Ulster finals played in the calendar year 1923, because the 1921 one between Monaghan and Derry didn't take place till two and a half years later, or uh, longer, October 23. The 22 final delayed the Civil War, etc., was played in 23, and the replay, and then there was the 1923 competition itself. And um, on this occasion, um, the uh, match was played at Balcarbot after a vote by uh, the Ulster Council. Um, it's a split vote seven two, and uh, this uh, match at Belturbet was one of many where the Anglo Celt really enlivens the occasion. You feel like you're almost present. They have done so well to capture the um, the convergence of so many players and the sub spectators and so many interactions and the modes of conveyance. So it said here special trains. I'm sorry, the replay at Belturbet, the beautiful grounds of Rory O'Meara's and the Stag Hall Road, five thousand pounds in gate receipts. Special trains from the Dock, Monaghan, and Drumord were, were packed. In fact, several hundred had to be left behind at the outlying station for want of accommodation. Motor cars, pushbikes, sidecars, and indeed go cars outnumbered ever, anything ever witnessed in Belturbet, which was packed with an enthusiastic crowd of gales. And there you are, the Sergeant Donahue was regulating the traffic, and guards also checked the tickets at the entrance. Um, and then the reporter went on further to say, uh, there were no encroachments in the playing pitch, even at half time. Of course, it was only natural now to, and again to hear up Calvin, up Monaghan, good man Johnny, and what's your man, etc. People of all ages were present, including many old men over the allocated, sorry, over the allotted span. The game was one of the finest ever witnessed in the county, Calvin. Um, Calvin led by seven points at half time, two forty three, but they they let it they let them lose it because Monaghan crept back in and scored a winning goal per Macalear near the end, and he was cheered off the field. So Monaghan won back the title where Calvin had been going for four in a row. Um, but the most significant development in all of this period really was um, the new grounds at Calvin project. Uh, so after many years of dissatisfaction with the, the quality of the grounds and their availability uh, and the Calvin showgrounds, the county board resolved in, uh, in December 1923 to, to, to do something about it. So uh, a committee met with P.F. Baxter uh, presiding, Andy McEntee, councillor, uh, Paul McShane, county councillor, J.J. Clark, secretary, or who from the Calvin Post Office. And it's significant when you think about it that you know, you've got these people involved in different forms of the state apparatus at the state south of the border. There's not to say there were huge favours done for Gaelic Games in all instances, but the very fact of having these people having access to the town hall and the courthouse for meetings, such things weren't available north of the border. There weren't those little perks and little devices and schemes that maybe enabled things to develop. Monaghan, Cavan, Donegal and other counties, they just didn't they, they didn't have that because of the, the different ethos that applied north of the border. Um, but in any case, uh, the the committee that was that appointed for this moved quickly. Uh, two fields were bought at Ross Culligan for a healthy sum, 700 for one and 360 for the other. Um, but the, the county subcommittee and the county board moved, set about quickly uh, to um, put this in place. And so by 1923, May, this is being put out to tender for galvanised iron hoarding work, uh, turnstiles, entrance gates, railing around the playing pitch and so on. 
and a Mr. McManus was appointed to do, do this and achieved it with great rapidity to the extent that by early you know, July, the ground, uh, although not officially opened, is hosting the Fesh Brefni, and um, which also is built to feature a prominent game between Cavan and Dublin for a set of gold medals. Um, so this had all happened very quickly. And um, but the big event, of course, was the official opening of the of the ground itself. And on that occasion, all there was an attempt to represent the various provinces. Uh, a Dublin team, which was sort of a selection picked by the Kickham's Club, famous Kickham's Club, played Cavan. Um, and but notable that in the billing for this in the poster it says or, or the ad it says the, the grounds will be officially opened by Don McCarthy TD. Uh, of Dublin, President GA, supported by Frank Fahey TD, Secretary Guilty League, and General Owen O'Duffy, late Ulster Secretary GA. Uh, it's significant because McCarthy was a common and nail government TD and Frank Fahey was anti treaty. And this was the first time, this was going to be the first time, and a conscious decision to get them together on this occasion when the Civil War had just ended to try and heal wounds. It also is advertised here something of significance that for the second time in Ireland, a megaphone wireless patent will be used by the speakers. So uh, anything you can. And another thing that they did to promote the event was a five pound uh, f- competition fundraiser. Um, so uh, between the hours of four and five, those who were wearing a certain badge that cost a shilling each had to turn around to somebody, a man, and say, you are the man with the five pound note. Um, well, they didn't find their man. It was held by a priest in the day, and maybe some feared to ask him or to challenge him about it. But uh, the the couple of boys got ten shillings for coming near, but didn't get it. Um, but but the the, the day itself was significant uh, for many things. Uh, arguably, the least significant is the fact that Cavan won their game, although the spectators were very excited about that fact. Um, the uh, it, it's it's notable that uh, also that uh, this or they try the the day I should say also that a lot of the hype for it also included talk about Dublin photographers coming to visit. Now there's no sign that they did, but and a city film company also being represented for the purpose of having various incidents made ready for the picture houses, presumably newsreels. Again, I don't know if any of that that was made or survived. Um, but in any case, the speeches on the day uh, reflect many significant things. Um, Dan McCarthy himself did open it on behalf of the GA. He declared it open. Frank Fahey, a country van the Gaelic, August and Berla. Uh, he spoke about he, he explored history of the area, talked about Miles the Slasher, Clahotter Castle, and Owen Rowan, even 1916, and made some interesting comments about the Civil War and the how things had become disunited. He pleaded for more Christian charity, more tolerance and forbearance for honesty of purpose and sincerity of con, of conviction. Um, and Owen O'Duffy, who was always prone to go off anyway at all in a, in a speech, um, said that made, what, his most significant contribution of all of this uh, was he was the person who seems to use the term Breffney Park first. He said what Croke Park was the Gales of all Ireland, Breffney Park would be to the Gales of Ulster. If you know the previous uh, newspaper ads, even in the week before, I was talking about Cavan G Athletic, or G, Cavan Athletic Grounds does not have any inkling of Breffney being brought into it. But if O'Duffy wasn't indeed the first person to coin the phrase, it certainly stuck from there, uh, there on. Um, and um, but no sooner had he said that positive thing that he t- turned and chastised the people of Cavan, presumably the town, uh, for raising only one hundred pounds in a, in a collection um, for the the grounds. Uh, and another sort of idiosyncratic uh, element of O'Duffy's speech, and there were always some, he said, the Gales recognise no boundaries except the four seas of Ireland. Indeed, I have heard that the RUC have presented a, medal, a set of medals to the cross Midland hurlers. Now, whatever about the RUC um, promoting, uh, sorry, uh, presenting a set of medals, I think they've, there's a much, much rarer chance of finding the hurlers in cross Midland. Um, but... Benny Fay, uh, the chairman, went out of his way to make a point then that this is the first occasion since the trouble started that a Republican TD and a Free State TD stood on the same platform, an achievement that no other organisation has accomplished. It's something we're very proud of and trusted as, as an augury of what is coming in the near future. So a very positive attempt to try and bring people together uh, for, on this occasion, a uh, very conscious effort, um, as outlined by Fay. Um, and... Uh, the occasion was further bookended by uh, a, 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 an all-night Cayley in the town hall, no, no six o'clock extension required there, uh, and, and the function 
Ulster had four sets of medals presented to the Cavan team, three of them Ulster Championship medals, uh, and the medals meant a lot back then. Um, but the, so the, de- the day itself was very successful and all went to plan. It was recorded later that, um, uh, sorry, here's what the Anglo Celtic said of the match itself. Of the occasion from 12 30 onward, lorries, motor cars, sorry, motor sidecars, and pushbacks from all parts of the points of the county delivered large numbers of enthusiasts. Of the 300 sideline seats provided, not one was vacant. And what seldom happens at Gaelic fixtures, a table was provided for the press representatives. Amongst the spectators were a large number of priests, army officers, and public representatives, while, of course, the fair sex, well dressed and comely, added additional charm to the proceedings. The takings totaled about £150. And perhaps the most telling testimony of all came from Hugh Smith, uh, later County Secretary, who wrote uh, in 1952, The day the park was opened, although young in years, I was not unmindful of the great events that were taking place around me. The swirl of the pipes and the martial airs of the brass and reed band had for me a natural appeal. And I listened to this inspiring addresses. I could not restrain my boyhood enthusiasm as I cheered on a victory to a Cavan team that who had an excellent win over the Ireland champions. There was an air of gladness everywhere one went that day. And as I grew older, I learned the real significance of what took place. The yoke of the foreigner had been cast off. The tradition period, transition period was over. A new era had begun. The only caveat to all that in the day was that the much anticipated megaphone didn't come from Dublin. They had to apologise that they'd received a wire explaining that it wouldn't get so far. Uh, nonetheless, it may be said that it was uh, a very successful occasion. Um, and uh, I should say also that Andy McShane, Andy McIntyre pictured there a long serving county councillor and newspaper man. He made the, the point that um, at the function afterwards that how proud it was that to him that a long term project have the, a long term project the ambition for him to, that this field would be created, but uh, that um, that would be that, that, that this would be created, um, but uh, this had been it, but given particular joy was that this is a field that he had very often as a young lad been chased out of, um, so they were very proud of it, um, so, but. Whenever Cavan went back to the Ulster fi- the Ulster semi final to win back their title, um, it was this time it was Derry who would suffer at the hands of the Northern Security Forces. Uh, so here they were leaving Derry City at two o'clock on a Saturday, and yet they didn't know a clue what was what was what was coming to them. Uh, they were kept. Uh, they were uh, delayed at Straban, delayed at Tempo. And then their party of 21 and all spectators and, and, and players, not very many, um, were arrested at Newton Butler, confined overnight in a very small room, kept without supper, without beds or furniture, and they got no sleep. And they were released midday on Sunday. Of the match itself, the Anglo Celt uh, neatly described that the Derry men did some neat things, but went in too much for groundwork, in other words, soccer, because they were essentially soccer players. They were short some of their best, and as one of them put it, all are good men that are not in jail or in the army. Now, Cavan won the game by 4-3 four to 1-1 one, uh, to one, one or something like that. So 11 points, I take it. Um, uh, so, but um, the, 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 the significance of this is not just the difference in standards uh, of playing, but the different um, methods of playing, uh, soccer, style versus Gaelic. But above all, what this signifies again, reiterates is the profound difficulty of circumstances north it, that how the, the gap between Cavan and Monaghan and Ulster was widening as a result of circumstances um, and the daunting task of having to go, on a, go to a match like that in Cavan and Monaghan it was often felt by the, the teams north of the border that the sacrifices they were making to go to Cavan and Monaghan grounds which had better get money that wasn't being appreciated and that they got no benefit out of it themselves so anyway Cavan went through to the Ulster final and this time they got to play at Bethany Park they meet again, and um, Cavan were determined from previous disappointments to make good. They had every motivation, um, and this time they delivered. Uh, it was another occasion when, another early occasion when Breffney Park was seen to its best. Um, beautiful sunshine, and a crowd of nearly 4,000. 
the, the report in the paper states that picturesquely situate as it is in a pleasant little valley, the pitch itself looked really beautiful. The newly mown sod, the air full of fragrance or the freshly cut grass, the lines prominently marked with lime, gold nets in place, all surrounded by a happy throng on whom the sun shone brilliantly. After all, this is a grand country to live in. And is there any sure or sure sign that Cavan won and won well in that last statement? Cavan won, in fact, 5 10 to 1 1. A massive victory over their old rivals, 21 points. And Vincent Dunn of Cavan Slasher scored all but four, sorry, scored four goals, which is significant because it was said for quite a few years after Kieran Jap Finley scored 1 9 in the 1979 final that he had set a new record until it was eclipsed by Oshie McConville in 1999 with 2 7. But in actual fact, here we are 56 years before Jap Finley, and Vincent Dunn was in his own way scoring 12 points through four goals going to the net. Um, it's amazing all the little vignettes you pick up when you go through the reports of the time in detail and don't just rely on maybe things from the last few years uh, for the formation of our records and their general discourse. But the Cavan had, um, this is the closest we have to a Cavan team photograph of this time, the Ulster champion team of 1924. So they retained their title in 24 and would, do, would win it again uh, repeatedly. Indeed, as I said, so at times it's in monopoly over the next few decades. It was certainly a duopoly between Cavan and Monaghan who came in with occasional victories. But what happened is that this team, these teams of the 1920s, uh, at this time of great uh, tumult nationally, of great disturbance, they had really helped to embed further the developing tradition of Cavan. Uh, and, you know, there's one of these players that this team would 1928 Cavan would go on to reach the All Ireland final for the first time, and indeed, then 1933 they would achieve the first landmark victory for Cavan and Ulster in the All Ireland uh, senior football title. Uh, Jim Smith pictured on the right there, just on his, gradu on his graduation day shortly around 1924 or thereabouts, he was perhaps the only player who was carried on right through from the early 20s right through to 1933 and 35 All Ireland victories. Uh, a remarkable man with in many respects. Um, but to really, we should to appreciate what happened at this time. I, it's very, it's it, what what happened in Cavan that year, um, with the opening of Bre the development and opening of Breffney Park was huge. It was really, in truth, the first county ground of the GAA. If you think about the fact that the GAA had only bought Croke Park in 1913, and with so much um, event of consequence, so many events of consequence in the next decade. Uh, there wasn't really much opportunity, but even the concept of a county ground wasn't fully de fully developed. There was uh, the idea of ownership wasn't fully embedded. It, uh, there had been a, la a large degree of a long term lease or occasional leases of fields when they were acquired. Um, but the Calvin, the, what Calvin had done, they had set a new standard, and you could say that it argued with it, that it had well did it worked for Calvin in a way that couldn't elsewhere due to the specific extreme ex, sort of the extremities of the geographical ends of the county Cavan town did make for a good center point and unlike other counties when there would be several sort of spread out towns vying for primacy or equal status in terms of hosting and so on Cavan sort of didn't have that problem uh, but there are other aspects in which you know even the the, the, the the football teams of this time but the opening of Breffney Park far sighted that it was um, it you know, it represented sort of Bran Cavan, Bran Breffney, um, and which, which was important. And uh, of course, Breffney didn't fully align with the print, the, 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 the kingdom of Breffney, it didn't fully align with the modern Cavan county. Um, but it was successfully adopted here, more so than elsewhere. For example, Tyrconnell County Council was adopted for Dun Donegal in the 20s for a period. But then this was discontinued because NSO1 wasn't actually within the area of, of Tyrconnell. But Cavan adopted Breffney, in fact, um, Breffney Park, but also the sec the county board correspondence at that time was had letterhead of paper, Custia County Breffney, even though there was never a county called Breffney as such. Um, and, you know, it, it mattered because in a lot of counties, districts rows and other things i mentioned there was east west pension and cavan but that dissipated somewhat around in the mid-20s but uh pettiness between different sections and different clubs held counties back to a great extent but cavan definitely took advantage of the situation and uh, in a positive way i suppose you could say but 
that they had uh, in the early 2020s, that they had the head start that they did. And so much of what they did uh, with, with, I mean, Breffney Park, there were a number of county grounds developed over the years afterwards, uh, but they took some years um, to, to come. And Breffney Park, by, you know, also uh, enabled the county, the county teams to play at a higher standard, to get used to playing on grounds where they would prefer, enable them to prefer better uh, for their All Ireland series matches. Um, and everything about it just represented a new level of organisation. Uh, it wasn't all uh, flawless, apparently, at that 1923 Ulster final. Women and ch children couldn't puff their way through the enclosure or hold their position. The children could see very little because of the high paling, and then the parental trouble would begin, the report uh, tells us. But the a, 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 a caretaker was appointed to look after the grounds. I was decided to appoint a caretaker. Uh, charged 10 shilling a week for evening matches and one pound for Sunday inter-club matches. Um, but it, Breffney Park is... And, I, I, and what, what Kevin did through that project um, is really a, a huge, it's a huge point in the GA's history, um, which set the standard for other counties. So, Shin Awil Lara Ogham, Anish, Breffney Abu, Gramagavas Eshitlam.